Well, hey, friends, welcome to the Midweek Refill. I'm your host, Bishop A. Reginald Littman. I'm excited to be here to share this word in the middle of the week with you to kind of help you get on track and get ready for worship. You know, every day should be a day of worship. Every day should be a day of God and godliness and godly principles and of love. I want to begin a new series for the next few weeks, and I want to encourage you to make sure that you go to our church website or click the descrip- description below in order to find the link for free, beautiful, colorful PDF handouts that accompany this teaching. There's a whole lot that you can deepen your study with with this particular series. My videos will be short. My time online will be short, but you can really benefit. And I want you to make sure that you definitely access the handouts that go along with this teaching. Well, we're going to start a series entitled Love, the Great Commandment. Love, the Great Commandment. We're going to start out by talking about loving God and loving others. Those of you who are watching me right now, I'd love for you to go into the comments and just type that in really quickly, loving God and loving others. Make sure you like, thumbs up, share, and all of that so that everyone can be a part of this teaching. And also, again, make sure you th- that you access the free colorful PDF handouts. You don't want to miss it. It's going to add so much more to this time together. Well, to begin with, We're going to start out talking about our introduction, which is a loving life and really having a loving life and how important it is to be a person of love and to display the love of God in your own life. You know, as you think about that wonderful creation and event called the Nobel Peace Prize, so many names come to mind of those who have been recipients from Dr. King to so many others who've received it. And for over 100 years, that prestigious Nobel Peace Prize, I mean, it's been awarded to individuals and organizations literally from all over the world. I mean, it has been given to people of great status and even some of what others might call humble or lowly beginnings. I mean, the list of winners for the Nobel Peace Prize, it just goes on and on. And it lists the who's who that are in our world. I mean, there have been presidents who've received it, prime ministers, ministers, and millions of people with great thinking minds, with concepts that literally have changed society. They have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, the the most likely of the candidates whose names naturally appear on this prestigious list as we could go down that list. And but there's one person's name who was never issued a Nobel Peace Prize that I believe probably should have been. You see, Mother Teresa, who would always wear her iconic blue and white sari. She dedicated her whole life as a Catholic nun, feeding the hungry. That was her passion. She would teach those who could not read. Mother Teresa spent her time loving people, helping the sick and comforting those who were dying in some of the most desperate and even deadly places on this earth. And why did she do this, you might ask? Was she ordered by some priest or some bishop in the Catholic Church to do this? No, she was not ordered by the church to go to the most impoverished places and to show love. In fact, it was her own choice because she wanted to reveal God's love to all of humanity. And all of you who are listening and watching me right now, we should make it our purpose to reveal God's love to all of humanity, regardless of their ethnicity or their financial status or where they were born and all of that. And as you think about some of the quotes 
that Mother Teresa left us with, you'll discover the love of God that flowed through her lips. Here's just a few on the screen right now. Intense love does not measure. It just gives. Think about that for a moment. The more intense your love is, you don't measure how much love you're giving and say, well, I gave this much love to that person, that much love to that person. No, intense love does not measure. It just gives. It just pours. It just flows. And that was the life that she lived. And that's a picture of the life that you and I should live. She also said, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. You see, the greatness of love and the purity of love that comes from the heart of God through us is not based on how great of things you do, but it is based on how much of great love you do what you do as you do it. How much different would our world be if people concentrated less on how great they are and how great their contributions are and focus more on how great their love is for other people. I think it would be a much better, much brighter, much more powerful existence that we would experience here as human beings. Mother Teresa also said this, the hunger for love is much more difficult to remove than the hunger for bread. Wow. And as you think about all of the starving countries that she served, all of the dying people that she served, that she ministered to, that she exhibited the love of God to, she said that the hunger for love far outweighs the hunger for bread. Being among starving people, she discovered that people, even in those distant lands who were starving for food, had an even stronger starvation and that was just to be loved. Wow. What a powerful series of quotes and statements that Mother Teresa left with us. And I think we should definitely follow and find God in those statements as we make endeavors to love other people with the love of God. So time and time again, Mother Teresa would speak about love and demonstrate love and it motivated her literally and tangibly and physically to love what some might consider the most unlovable people on the planet you know because we have a tendency to love because of because of what a person has or because of what a person can do but the real love of god loves in spite of in spite of who a person is in spite of how a person is, in spite of what a person has, in spite of what a person can do for you. So when we look at her life, you might wonder where on earth would that kind of love emanate from? How can you love unconditionally? Well, the greatest commandment in the Bible is to love one another and to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So as we jump into part one in this brief teaching, I want to talk about defining biblical love. And again, make sure that you get access to all of the free colorful PDF handouts. You'll thank me later, trust me, because it's going to allow you to probe much deeper than I have time to share with you right now. And you'll be able to grow and even learn something new from this experience. So I want you to make sure you access the free PDF handouts. Let's look at 1 John chapter number 4, verse 7, 8, and verse 9. It reads like this. I love this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. 
What a powerful passage of scripture that is. You'll notice that John writes here and says, we have an edict to love one another. Why? Because love emanates from the heart of God. And notice this next line. Everyone that loveth is born of God. Of course, whenever you see E-T-H at the end of a word, it's always an S in our modern English. So it means this. Everyone who loves continuously is born of God and knows God. So the emblem or the badge of our knowing God is the love that we display to other people. Isn't that powerful? He that loves not knows not God. So when there is a void of love in our lives toward other people, it is evidence that there is truly a void in how well we know God. You know, you can know God on different levels. You can know God on the surface, or you can know him deeply. And to know God deeply means that you walk with him and you want to please him in your ways, your actions, your thoughts, and your behavior and conduct, whether people are watching you or not, because you're always conscious of the fact that God is always watching you. And the Bible goes on to say in 1 John 4, 7, through nine, that in this was manifested the love of God toward us. This is how God displayed, if you will, his love toward us, because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's how we see the love of God, by God giving and depositing his only begotten son, sending him into this world that you and I could get to know God through Jesus. That's so amazing. The love of God at work in our lives should produce a love for others as God sent Jesus and produced his love for us. Well, the word love, of course, is found all throughout the Bible. I mean, you can find it all over the scriptures in both Old and New Testaments. And it represents sort of a foundational truth of the Christian faith. Love is a cornerstone of the Christian faith. It's it's one of those words that you cannot do without as you think about God and as you think about the Christian faith as a whole. And of course, our English language, you know, only has one word for love. But when you really research the scriptures, which were, of course, written originally in Hebrew, Greek and Aramaic, you'll discover that there are several words that are critical to know concerning that word love. While we have one, the scriptures gives us several. For instance, in the New Testament, the Greek word for love, one of them is phileo, and it's used in the Bible in the New Testament to denote friendship. You may be familiar with the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's based on friendship, being fond, being affectionate, loving as a brother or a sister, if you will. And then, of course, there's the Greek word agape from the New Testament. Now, agape is used more often in the scriptures, and agape literally represents a love that is unique specifically to the Christian faith. It's that godly kind of love. It's not referring to eros, which would be uh, that sensual type of love between a couple, but this is more of a godly type of love. And of course, the Apostle John, he wrote so much about agape and that godly kind of love in the Gospels and also in the epistles. So love is of God because God is love. And we find that in 1 John chapter number one, love is of God and God is love. So if you are of God, then you should have the love of God, because God is indeed love. Hey, listen, I hope you got something out of this very brief study. You will go far deeper in your own personal time of meditation if you access that free PDF handout. It's going to bless you, I promise you. It's much more detailed than I have time to go into. But I want to pray with you right now. And I'd like for you to list your prayer requests or prayer concerns in the chat or 
You can send it to prayerwithbishop at gmail.com. But I want to close with a specific prayer, and I want you to pray this right along with me. Come on, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have scattered the word love all throughout the Holy Scriptures. I confess that I have thrown this holy word around flippantly and used it in incorrect context. Your agape toward me is so hard for me to fathom. You are the God who loves because you are love. The greatest display of your love for me was Jesus. So we pray this prayer of faith. Lord, help us to appreciate your love for us in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, I really enjoyed sharing with you. I hope that you will like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. Let me know what this means to you. And don't you dare forget whatever you do to access the free PDFs that go along with this teaching. You're gonna love it. Hey, I look forward to sharing with you next time in part two. We're going to talk about a question for Jesus. Take care. God bless you. We love you dearly.